Hello all, Rick here with my spoiler review of episode 10 of Picard's season 3, The Last Generation. First off, I want to give props to the opening scene of the Enterprise and the Borg elements added in, instead of the usual introduction, as well as the closing music being the TNG theme. If nothing else, this is a better ending than Star Trek Nemesis. <laughs> the Borg have gained control over the youth of the Sol system, and we start with a panning shot reminiscent of the TNG opening and a general warning from President Anton Chekhov, a respectful inclusion as the son of Pavel Chekhov and named after Anton Yelchin. The situation sounds dire, as those within the planetary shield of Earth too are fending off the converted population. The transmitter cube was in the gases of Jupiter, having arrived there last part through a transwarp conduit. That's worrying, the Borg have managed to create such an inroad with such precision, but well, with the Borg now gone, do we have a conduit to the Delta Quadrant on the doorstep of the Federation? That would be cool. The cube itself is operating at about a third of its usual power. Judging by its looks, it's been remade for this singular purpose. The Borg are indeed desperate, ravaged from Janeway's plague in Voyager's Endgame, and the maddened and lone queen has diverted all this to the one gambit. The drones aboard are being consumed to sustain the Queen, its armies are decaying, and this is a desperate shot at evolving the Borg for a new age to avoid their extinction. The Queen herself is a Geiger-style nightmare of metal and flesh integrated into her surroundings. In many ways, this is a display of the Borg in their true colours. A monstrous merger of flesh and steel, and an empire that persists so long as the Queen alone survives. The new Borg vision, however, is not one of assimilation, but the usurping of others through the biological infiltration of cultures. This makes them more aggressive, as it draws a defined line between those that can be Borg and those who are expendable. So these new Borg, in theory, would quicker turn to destruction than before, especially as the Borg coding can be passed down through the genes naturally. Picard chooses to plug himself back into the collective hive mind in order to reach Jack, and it really is the ultimate sacrifice for him, more so than death. The Borg assimilation was the greatest trauma he had ever experienced, because it made him the antithesis of everything he was. The fact he's willing to risk that once more to get to Jack was a powerful moment. Jack, meanwhile, is enjoying the feeling of connectivity and understanding the hive mind brings. A part of his mind was always seeking this connection, the organic Borg, seeking its link, which now has him feeling intoxicated in its unity. Overcome with the connection, he seems content to allow it to blissfully carry away his will. Picard's offer to remain reminds Jack that this connection he yearns for is not that of the Borg programming, but human, and it's enough to return some semblance of clear thought to him, and he disconnects from the lie. I enjoyed the moment where Picard admits his own personal flaws at preventing himself that connection all his life, keeping people at a distance, even his closest friends. This was something season 2 tried to tackle too, and while I liked where they were going there, their delivery was… muddled, let's say. Here it is concise, and we have Picard once more faced with his inner weakness through the Borg as an instigating force. He was used in Best of Both Worlds, he lost his cool in Star Trek First Contact, and now confronts his fear of fatherhood. It seems the Borg routinely force introspection upon him. The Queen, too, tries to claim ownership of Jack through twisted motherhood, a creating factor in his production, but she would seek to use him, mistaking that for nurturing. This reveals the ultimate lie of the Borg Collective. For all its unity and voices, none have a say, and it's the most selfish of organisations. 
A paradise that can be rebuilt so long as its leader survives is not one for the people, but its selfish ruler, to paraphrase a life lesson. She cannibalises everything so that she alone can survive, even her own collective, who she once claimed to represent. With the Enterprise swooping in to beam them out, I did find it strange that there had been no roof to this chamber, which was much more cavernous than the scene suggested, however, but the moment was a joyful one, and Riker's poignant call to his Imzadi was heartfelt. Earlier too, when Riker chose to stay behind to get Picard out of the cube, I was convinced that he, Picard or Worf, were going to end up dead by the end of the episode. So it was a great surprise that we actually got a happy ending for all involved, and dare I say it, it was almost too good to be true. Now, I would rather have this ending than the complete opposite, don't get me wrong, but if ever there was a time for someone to bow out permanently, this was that time. I think I was just so expectant of someone to cop it that when no one perished it felt kind of anticlimactic. It's an odd criticism to have, and once again I reiterate, I prefer this to having a despondent ending. But I think that has been the only real issue with this series as a whole. The reverence it treats these characters with is often spelled out on screen a little too much for my tastes, such as Riker's family speech in episode 9, and I find myself thinking at times, yes yes I get it, I like these characters too, but it felt like the series was still trying to make up for the time Admiral Clancy swore at Picard, like Luke Skywalker catching the lightsaber and to the camera saying it should be respected. I think they could have taken a few more risks, but in hindsight I would much, much rather have this happy ending than a darker tone. I have mentioned before how the action scenes in this series got a little lacklustre in places, and the storming of the bridge from Seven and her team was one of these moments. The ensuring firefights had next to no range nor cover, and yet many shots still missed. The plot shields were on full once again at this point, but one thing I did like was seeing Seven one armor phaser rifle as she has done in the past series. They recaptured the bridge by using transporter tagging phaser systems or something. I want to know more about those for sure, but for now, it's some rigged up tech to save the day. My guess is it kind of tags the target and the Titans transporters do the rest of the work. Seven makes the choice to engage the controlled fleet to distract as much as the Titan can, and they have several advantages, which is just as well or they would be destroyed easily. The cloaking device breaks the line of sight communication signal, which seems like a glaring flaw in such a system. The other benefit is the library of prefix codes that the Titan uses to penetrate the shields of the other Starfleet vessels. Aside from the techie aspects of this feat which feel very plot convenient, I did feel exhilarated by the confrontations, but never truly thought the Titan was in danger, unlike the crew of the Enterprise. The Galaxy class moves with the finesse of a much smaller vessel, and we have seen it perform the occasional feat of unexpected nimbleness, but not to this extent. It was a little excessive, but did I enjoy it? Yes, it was fun and flashy to watch, but it did leave me puzzled and trying to ratify seven years of watching this huge cruiser gracefully float by with the fighter craft like tight turns it was pulling. However, the conversation preceding this I liked a lot. Data, studying the convoluted route to the centre of the transmitter cube, knew he could manage it despite the odds and statistics being against him from the feeling in his gut. Human instinct. Brilliant, and more aspects that were beyond the prior incarnation of Data. In fact, Jumping forwards to the ending scenes, Data undergoing counselling was also oddly gratifying to see. He could truly experience and converse about emotions now, and I loved the line that being human was as complex a task as trying to attain humanity. It tells me Data still has experiences to explore and a journey ahead of him, even in his old age. 
Now, I'm not entirely sold on the Enterprise G. The USS Titan was the hero ship of this series, and an amazing vessel in its own right. From the original captain to Seven taking command, the Titan already has the markings of an impressive legacy, and I feel it did not need to adopt the name Enterprise, when it was perfectly liked and appreciated as its own successor to the original Titan. Now, in terms of the look, I feel that it is a major step back in the lineage of vessels named Enterprise, which have always been at the forefront of every facet of Starfleet innovation, while the Titan was a specialty ship, a smaller vessel, and not one that could hold its own in combat, despite how it was portrayed in the finale. And now it is stepping into the role of the Enterprise G, I cannot help but feel that, that was unnecessary and almost pandering. Yes, a part of me is a little salty to see the Enterprise F out of the picture, but I would have been perfectly happy for the Titan to emerge as the new flagship of the Federation in its place until a new Enterprise entered the picture. But again, the conversation immediately preceding that scene, I enjoyed with Crusher's nerves and Picard's support. That shows that things for our retired Admiral have continued to improve with his son, and he gets that connection with his family at last, something that was always missing from Picard. I'm glad nepotism was brought up by Jack. Of course, that is something that would be on their minds, and it reflects his more pragmatic nature. Jack is not a blind follower, much like Seven of Nine, so this should be an interesting command, if nothing else. Worf was still used for comedic effects, which annoys me a little, but again, I still laughed or smiled at every joke, so not much has changed there for me. Every member of the cast had something to do in the finale, which needed to happen to be a cohesive send-off for the crew. Overall, I think this episode had plenty of good dialogue and moments between the characters that were delivered with heartfelt and deep care. Then the show switches to action scenes that, while fun, made me scratch my head on closer inspection, but then it's on to the next endearing or dramatic moment. So overall, I forgive it its faults, because I was having fun, and as a biased Trekkie, I'm going to go easy on Star Trek I enjoy more than the ones I don't. Thank you for watching this review of Picard's finale. I intend to continue with some speculative videos at the State of the Galaxy as well as some digging to see just how interconnected Star Trek Online is with this tale with it so much infiltrating the series. Until then, I've been Rick, thank you for watching, and goodbye.